everybody, I'm your host, Stephen Michael, welcoming you along with my broadcast partner, multi-time world champion and analyst, Jonathan Jones. And for the second time in less than a month, we are in the heart of Southeast Asia as we greet you on a lovely late morning here, preparing for the all-important three qualifying sessions to determine the starting grid for Sunday's inaugural Grand Prix of Binh Dinh, Vietnam. Now, the 2024 campaign kicked off in spectacular fashion with a surprising winning performance on the final corner of a 30-lap Grand Prix in Lake Toba in Indonesia. But before we get to the recapping of the start of the season, Jonathan, let's talk a little bit about this beautiful environment that we have around here as we both arrive to the Central Coast for the first time in our lives this week. Give me your impressions. Oh, unbelievable, Steve. We've just come from Indonesia where it was very, very spectacular. But here in North Vietnam, my goodness, it is something else, isn't it? I mean, the beaches, golden sands, kilometers of beaches. We're staying at a hotel about 15 kilometers south of here and it is five star plus plus. So if you're looking to visit and you're coming to Asia, trust me, this is one of the regions you need to come to. Yeah, as you mentioned, the lovely pristine beaches and historic treasures make this an ideal location to come any time of the year. Now, JJ, this race circuit here in Tainan Lagoon is long and it's set up for pure speed as well. Take us around and give us your impressions of this 1.9 kilometer 1.1 challenge for the drivers that'll face this weekend. Like you said, Steve, this is going to be a fast circuit, no question. It's very open. Uh, the water's perfect condition. So you come down past the start finish line there into turn number one, 90 degree turn. Get that boat accelerating 370 meters into turn number two on the far end of the circuit. Throw the boat round and then you come into the only right hand that we have. That's turn number three. And because it isn't a really hard turn, you've got to Get the ball on top, float it around there, don't lose any speed. Then you're 400 meters down to four, five, little short shoot there, round into number six and down past the start finish line. It's going to be a challenging race course and it should be a lot of fun. So I'll tell you what, it's going to be beginning here and the conditions are going to be red hot this afternoon. Right now the wind isn't kicking up much. It's coming from the southeast at about five knots, but they're expecting about 12 knots of wind here shortly. Now the 2024 season kicked off with 17 drivers making their way to the season's longest circuit, a 2.2 kilometer highly lit and a pair of right handers thrown in the mix on Lake Toba. Let's take a look at how the highlights burned off. As they took off now, it was Rusty Wyatt, the driver from Canada. Nobody had really heard about this man outside of North America. He finished fourth at a North American series a year ago, and he jumped into a DAC boat with the Sharjah team for the first time in his life, and he loved the boat. He set the fast time in Q1, was third quickest in Q3, a big, big surprise, as he did a 103.459. But then the veteran, Eric Stark, the Swedish driver on the Dubai's victory team come out and did a little bit quicker. He went faster by three tenths of a second. He did a 102.685 and he thought he had the pole, but hold on a minute. The world champion, Jonas Anderson, fighting for another pole position, came out and went even faster with a 102.662 and he beat his fellow friend from Sweden by two one thousandth of a second to nail down the pole position to start the race and he was all excited and what a great way to start the season. Now we've got a total of 18 drivers from three continents and here in the morning to do battle in order to gain the number one spot on the dock for Sunday's Grand Prix in Vietnam. Here's a look at how the participants will come out numerically. Jonas Anderson, the defending world champion in that number one spot. He's hoping to get another pole position in a row and continue his streak. Next to him is a real surprise, Stefan Arndt. He is a driver from uh, Slovenia who has come over from Formula 2, and he finished fourth after qualifying a fine fourth in the first race in Indonesia. Then Ahmad Al-Afin, who has uh, docked a race uh, after having an incident in Sharjah with then world champion Sean Torrente, he is back. And the victory team has their full complement of two drivers. Eric Stark, who finished a very close second at the opening round, chasing his first world title, being the number four machine. Then Thaniel Quimsey, he is one of uh, two Team Abu Dhabi drivers. Thani, a veteran of over 20 years of racing, had a disappointing performance in uh, Indonesia, hoping to improve on that. And then Alberto Comparado, the youngster, second-generation driver who is running, 
He had an engine change this morning, so he is uh, coming out and he's going to hope that his engine will make a difference in qualifying. Peter Marais from France, part of the China CTIC team, along with uh, Brett Dillard, both finished up in the uh, top 10. Brett Dillard in the race was 10th. Peter Moran was eighth, but then he got docked a lap, and he ended up uh, finishing in the 11th spot. Ben Joff, the driver from the U.K., looking strong, a good impression in practice this morning. And then Duarte Benevente, the veteran who has practically more Grand Prix starts than anybody in the history of the sport, picked up uh, three points last uh, race, and he's hoping to gather more this time around. Alexandre Borgo and uh, also uh, Bartak Marzawak, the driver who won a year ago in Indonesia and who uh, did fairly well in the opening race looking to gather more points up. So a lot of big question marks, but really the story so far in this season has been about uh, one man who really surprised everybody and uh, for that, it was uh, Rusty Wyatt, the driver out of Canada. Well, I'll tell you what, this morning, my colleague Jonathan Jones is perusing the paddock, ready to give us the latest updates and stories leading us up to the all-important qualifying session. That will determine the starting lineup for Sunday's Grand Prix, along with tomorrow's pair of sprint races. That will determine the world championship table. Let's go down and join my partner of 23 years, Jonathan Jones. What's the feeling in the paddock? What do you got, Jonathan? A lot of tension down here at the moment, Steve. I'm down on the uh, actual start pontoon where all the boats are lining up, getting out for that qualifying session that we're going to start in about 50 minutes. I'm down here with... I'm, da I'm down here with uh, Zanbergen, one of his mechanics. I'm just going to have a little chat with him. Things are looking... Thing things are look... Things are look... Things are looking really good out there this morning. You put up a really fast time in, uh, in the uh, free practice. How confident are you for the weekend? I'm pretty confident, I'd say. Ferdinand is a, is a great driver, and uh, you know we, we, uh, we really hope the conditions stay as good as they are, and uh, I think he will be, be able to set a good lap for the qualification and then uh, make, make something good out of it. So it, it sounds pretty good with Zandberg, and no question about it. They had one or two issues, as you know. He had the accident uh, in Indonesia a couple of weeks back. But the boat seems to be running really, really well out here this morning, Steve. So he's one of the guys to look out for. Yeah, Ferdinand Zandberg, and hoping to turn his luck around. Of course, uh, he was in a situation, Jonathan, where uh, he thought he was going to get a nice top 10 performance and uh, do well. He's had a pole position and a victory already in his career two years ago. But he's been snake bit of recent, and he a barrel rolled down in that first lap in Indonesia and was the first driver to drop out of the race. So we'll see if he can improve things this time around. Well, the man who can't get any better is the surprising rookie, Rusty Wyatt out of Ontario, who jumped on with Scott Gilman, the team leader of Sharjah, and surprised the world as he came out and showed everybody that he had a very strong performance in a DAC boat that he had never gotten into before until uh, the race in Indonesia. The 29-year-old uh, uh, elevator technician. Let's hear from the man who is leading this championship and hoping for more this weekend. Yeah, the, the, the rookie status is, is good. You know, it, it puts out much more pressure on you, and I like the pressure, right? So it, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a big weekend here. We obviously won our first race, so... A lot of pressure, I'd say, on that. You know, I, I'm, it is what it is. You know, we're just out here doing our best, but uh, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to be fighting for that win again. All smiles for him, and uh, he's hoping to uh, continue on his progress. And uh, as JJ marches his way along the paddock, uh, looks like he's uh, tuned in with the CTIC China team. Jonathan, what do you got? So we got Brent Dillard, one of the drivers, just going to have a quick chat with him now to see how he's setting the boat up for this circuit because it's very different to the one we had in Indonesia. Brent, how are things going so far today? Well, this morning we tried something different. We tried a bigger hub on the steering and it felt like a completely different boat. So I was literally all over the place trying to learn it and uh, we really didn't learn anything from it. Uh, it's something we got to try at home. So we put the original steering hub back in here and now it should feel like my original boat that I love so much that handles great. David Moore did an amazing job how quick he changed the steering hub in that boat in an hour. I mean, that was that's amazing. And then Philip Chap helped me out with some props. 
So we're, the whole test session is just a scrap and we're going to start completely over. Where do you reckon you're going to finish in this? Can you get into the top six today for that main event on Sunday? Yes, sir. I believe it. So very, very positive there. Again, Brent doing a great job out there. Another guy I'd love to have a chat with now if he's got a few minutes is Comparato, the young driver. A lot of pressure on him this weekend because he's this year, he's running for Team Abu Dhabi. How's it going out there? Uh, we had a small problem in uh, free practice, but now uh, the guys fix it. I didn't have so much lap time in the water this morning, but uh, yeah, I will try my best. We have the pace, so. Yeah. It's a big step from where you were in the past to where you are now, a lot more pressure on you. How are you taking that pressure going forward with Team Abu Dhabi? Uh, I don't think it's a lot of pressure. It's more like they are helping. So, uh, you know, with the experience of we and all the guys, they are just making me improve as a driver, so. I saw this morning, he got up to fourth position there right at the end of the session because he did have an engine problem, as I understand, at the beginning. Watch out for this guy because, I'll tell you, I wouldn't be so surprised. He's going to get in the top six, I'm fairly confident. Is he going to get that pole position here for the first time? Yeah, I got news for you, Jonathan. He jumped up to third. He was a little bit better, but he had a real problem. He got one lap in, and all of a sudden the engine uh, went sour on him and they had to tow the boat in and he was gone for a long time in that hour session. He came out late, but he still managed to get 17 laps in and he put in the third quickest time with a 45-366. So Alberto Comparato, who thought he was stuck in a hole, all of a sudden now has got to be brimming with confidence and feeling good about today's event. And I'll tell you what, let's take the conversation a little bit farther as we had a chance to talk with the young Italian from Team Abu Dhabi a while ago. Yes, we had a small problem uh, with the first engine. I make one straight and I lose power. So we had to come back, change engine, and then I didn't have so much time to get used again on this boat. But in the end, I make a quite okay lap. I still have a lot to improve. Now we check the data with Attilio. I think we can be in the fight if I drive good. So we we'll see later. Yeah, the youngster from Italy, I'll tell you something. His father, for many years, raced as a teammate with Guido Capolini, who is now the team manager with Team Abu Dhabi. So Fabio Camparato raced uh, and was very strong. He won a race in Malaysia back in uh, 2004. We kid him and call him the King of Malaysia. And his son is trying to do something that uh, only one other family in powerboat racing has ever done. Father and son winning races and in one season. It has and the thing is for him is that uh, he's hoping to get his first uh, victory. So uh, Fabio Camparato looking good so far here we'll see how it does but talk about a young lady who has been racing for a few years on this circuit and of course she's trying something a little bit different she's running with a four-stroke mercury engine she is introducing herself to the uim formula one world championship for her 99th career start she's got a victory in the first round she started 10th in qualifying she finished seventh here's jonathan with one of his favorite drivers marit stromoy of norway Exciting weekend for Merit. They are slowly but surely getting this new boat dialed in. They're now running with a four-stroke V8 engine instead of the other two strokes that most of the other drivers are running. Merit, give us a bit of an insight. How different is it to run a four-stroke compared to a two-stroke? And how much progress are you actually making? Oh, it's a completely different package. I mean, uh, the engine is, uh, is, is of a different kind. It accelerates in a different way. Uh, and uh, I really have to drive the boat differently. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's very exciting. We're making progress for every uh, every session. We're in the water, and uh, I'm quite confident that by a very short amount of time we will be there. And as far as the boat's concerned, because obviously this engine weighs a lot more than the two-stroke, you've probably had to change the design of the boat somewhat. How much progress are you making on that front? The boat is also very different from what we used to. First of all, it's a new brand for me. It's, this is the DSC. And obviously because the weight of the engine is, is more and also sits a lot higher because it's a, it's a V8 instead of a V6, we had to compensate that by building a boat which is obviously wider and, uh, and of a different kind to get the same momentum inside the corner. And it seemed to work very, very well. And where you're at at the moment, Compared to the two-stroke, because obviously you've been so used to that for such a long time, do you feel that this has a lot of potential four-stroke technology going forward? 
Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I usually say I had 17 years on the two-stroke and I have now 20 hours in this one and we are already nearly there. So I'm confident that this is the way to go and I'm very happy for the, for the engine and for the boat. And uh, like I said, every session we make progress and uh, I'm excited to see here. So Steve, a great project to look forward to going forward in the future because it has massive potential, but it's still very early days. Back to you. Yeah, it's true, Jonathan. The big thing with uh, Mercury is they have uh, taken back the information that Marit Stromoy has given them throughout her last uh, three races plus, and uh, they've really made a lot of changes with that engine, and she seems to be steadily getting better and better and feeling more and more confident in a brand new boat that she hadn't been running until midway through last year. And as uh, she mentioned, a brand new engine. So Marit Stromoy, as we said, starting race number 99, she is trying to get up into the top six. In other words, the top six at the end, Q3, we call it, uh, fighting for pole position. This will be, if she can do it and get up into the top six, would be her 19th career top six battle for pole position. And uh, we'll see if she can do it this afternoon. She was uh, running uh, this morning. She was 11th quick with a 46.29. But again, that was this morning. Now, the interesting thing about the weather right now and this is such a lovely city here of uh, Queen Eon, which is right, uh, right in the Binh Dinh uh, province of uh, Vietnam, right here on the central coast. It's such a lovely area, but it's hot today. I'll tell you what, it's humid, it's gonna be hazy, and the wind is coming out of the southeast, which means it's coming from the land, not from the sea, and they say it's gonna be 12 knots by the time we get going here. We're just shortly, uh, about 10 minutes away from official uh, qualifying to begin. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have three qualifying sessions like we normally do. We'll have uh, 20 minutes where everybody will be out and they'll fight to get into the top 12. If you get in the top 12, you move on to Q2 after a short intermission. And then they'll go for 15 minutes and then you'll take the top six. That'll be 10 minutes. Wicked shootout, it'll be a rock and roll speed show that's about to go and we're getting excited about getting it and uh, kicking it in another gear as everybody's getting uh, ready to go. A lot of the drivers uh, were talking about how the big difference was in coming here to Vietnam, where a lot of us who live in parts of the world where this is just lovely normal weather 12 months of the year, but for a lot of Europeans, including the top two uh, uh, Swedish drivers from um, uh, the from the northern part of Europe, I mean, they, they came out of minus 10 to uh, this weather, which is, uh, you know, 30 degrees C by the time we get rolling today. And uh, the surprising photo that we saw earlier was with uh, Rusty Wyatt and his brother were sitting on a iceberg, a flow of ice on a lake north of Toronto about six days ago with their shirts off having fun. And uh, they go from that extreme where the ice is now starting to melt in Canada where here, you know, the water temperature is probably close to 28 degrees. So the big thing here is uh, everybody getting acclimated. So uh, let's go back down. We were talking about Team Sharjah. Uh, JJ, what do you got, my friend? Well, one guy, Steve, that really has set the world alight uh, this year. Uh, unbelievable performance in Indonesia. As we all know, Rusty Wyatt, the Canadian. And we're down here with some of his mechanics that are preparing the boat on the pontoon before he actually gets in and they strap him in. I mean, this Team Charger this year, my goodness, they really have come alive, haven't they? Yeah, how, do you, how do you see yourself moving forward? And how do you see how you're going to develop the boat and get up to that pole position possibly for the event here? Yeah, we'll take it one step by one step, you know. We've got a good setup. Rusty's really comfortable in the boat. Only one race down, so, you know, we we got to make a few changes before qualifying after, you know, Q1, Q2. So, yeah, we're feeling pretty confident, yeah. That's great news. I mean, this is one team that really has come a long way this year, no question about it. So, winning the last race, obviously fantastic. Do you reckon that you can win here for a second time? Well, look, you know, it's early to say, but anything's possible, Jonathan, you know. So we'll see how we go in Q3 and see where we start off the pontoon tomorrow and, you know, try our best. That's cool. Steve, back to you. Another team to be watching out for here in, uh, in Vietnam this weekend. Very, very confident is the Sharjah team with uh, four-time world champion uh, 
Uh, we get a chance to uh, wonder how uh, he'll do uh, keeping his boys in flow with Scott Gilman, the uh, team manager. Now, Philip Roms, the other member of the Charger team, came out. The young Finn uh, was 14th quickest this morning in practice. And Rusty uh, was out there for about 16 laps. He was about seventh quick. So the interesting thing here is that not everybody shows their hand early. And we expect to see the same thing in qualifying in Q1, which will be, as we mentioned, a 20-minute session that's going to start shortly. And uh, if you go back and use the numbers that we had in Indonesia in Q1, Rusty Wyatt only ran three laps and was the fastest driver in Q1. As a matter of fact, the UIM officials who didn't know him kind of questioned uh, the time, and then they realized it was fast. They said, oh, my word, he was the quickest. Eric Stark, who was uh, second quickest in Q1 uh, in the uh, first round of the championship, was eight laps in. And then Jonas Anderson, who eventually got pole at the first race in Indonesia, he only came out for three laps in Q1. So you got to really keep an eye on the, the leading trio of drivers. They just need to finish up in the top 12 fastest, and then they will get more serious as the day goes on here in the hour. So uh, it'll be interesting to see who makes the quick exit then you know that they're running very quickly. So uh, again, we've got all 18 drivers back, nine teams from uh, 13 different countries, and uh, we're getting the boats brought in here. And uh, as we talked about, it's gonna be hot and hazy today. Not much of a wind. They were talking about more wind coming, and uh, at the moment, we haven't seen it. But again, it's coming from behind our backs, which means it's coming off the land. And uh, that's a good sign because we do have a bit of an open bay out here. This is the Tainé Bay. And uh, they're talking about a little bit stronger winds tomorrow morning. And then on Sunday, the Grand Prix morning, which is uh, going to both be starting at 11 o'clock local time, uh, 4 a.m. Uh, GMT time, uh, they're expecting the winds to be even more stronger. So uh, we'll hold our breath. They're not talking about... Uh, you know, wicked winds, but they're saying that it's going to get a little bit more windy as the weekend goes on, as you see the drivers now pacing back and forth. I think the interesting thing about some of these drivers and how they play it cool, as we look at uh, Fabio Camparato pouring water over his head, Jonathan, you know, in a lot of different uh, uh, race series, whether it's on roads and water, wherever, a lot of guys wear uh, cool vests, but I don't know how many drivers here are actually trying out the cool vests this weekend. Well, he for one is. I went down there, checked him out there. He was really cool. What they have is uh, almost, as you said, it's like a vest with a zip on the front of it, and it's filled with a gel. And that gel, what they do is they put it into a freezer, um, leave it there overnight, and then for that gel to go back to liquid form takes about 40, 45 minutes, something like that, as I understand, which means when they're in the boat, they're a lot cooler because when you're sitting in a cockpit like this and it's something like 35, 40 degrees here today, very, very humid, it gets so hot in there. The problem you have then is as you get tired as the race goes on, you lose concentration. But if you can be fresh and as you pointed out, Steve, wearing some of these cool suits that they do in many other forms of motorsport, I think it's a big advantage. So it'll be interesting to see this weekend who is and who isn't wearing that and how it helps them. Yeah, t totally different philosophies. Some people feel it's not going to be a problem. It's uh, real short, but other people are going, wait a minute, I need all the brakes I can get and advantages, and they'll take that into consideration. Tell you what, Jonathan, you and I talked about this. We've been talking about it all week. This is such a lovely area. We've never been here before in the Binh Dinh province in the lovely city of Queen Anne as uh, it's surprisingly uh, spectacular. And we had a chance to go over to see some shrines the other day. And uh, the beaches are second to none here. Yeah, I spent a couple of days ago on the beach, uh, as I mentioned earlier, down by our hotel there. Well, first of all, we have these villas right on the beach. You've got your own private swimming pool, which is totally enclosed, uh, which is part of the package that they offer down there. I mean, and, and the, the, the villas themselves, my goodness, they're on another level. In fact, we are the first people staying there because they've been developing this, as I understand, for about five or six years. And this week they opened it and we're the first guys in there. And also, the beaches, as you mentioned, 
the villas are actually back up onto the beach. The sand is just, it's, it's what we call silica sand, very, very fine, very white. And the sea is so clear and blue. So, you know, a great place to come for a holiday, no question about that. Yeah, as you said, it's almost like powdery sand. It's yeah. so perfect. Uh, it's warm sand, but I'll tell you, it's refreshing once you jump in. Yeah, and the other thing is, Steve, as you say, we, we've been sort of uh, checking out some of the other resorts and uh, um, a lot of the interesting uh, cultural uh, uh, areas of uh, this, this area of Vietnam. And, uh, yeah, we've had a great time out here so far. And uh, we've got a couple of days to kill after the event, so we're probably going to see a lot more in that time. Yeah, from our drone camera, you can see all of the paddock area that's uh, just to the lower part of your screen that was all rebuilt or put together, actually, since uh, December. And this is all new land that they've laid concrete on, and it's a spectacular uh, mission to get this uh, lined up and professional for the paddock area. And they've done such a wonderful job of landscaping and lining this all up, and it's uh, second to none, really. I mean, if you came here six months ago, there was none of this. Um, they've actually concreted an area of probably a kilometer, kilometer and a half, and then they built uh, an enormous press center on there, um, lots of shops, uh, restaurants, and everything else, and then, of course, created an enormous area for the paddock, so that all the containers, when they come in, they're all lined up at the back of the paddock, then they set up the team, set up all the garages, and then we got all the timing on the front. I mean, it is no mean feat putting this together. So for the local organizer to have done so much in such a short time, you've got to take the hat off to them. All right, it's qualifying day, and as I said, it's a rock and roll speed show, and it's about to go, Jonathan. We're just a matter of a couple of minutes away as we get these drivers out here for three qualifying sessions, last-minute discussions with uh, drivers and officials and uh, also some media members chatting away. You don't want to hang out too long. I think with you doing those interviews, it was the perfect timing to talk to some of the drivers, and sometimes they won't give you as much as you hope because they're starting to focus in on the narrow job of what they got to have, but uh, they seem to be relaxed and enjoying uh, the morning. Yeah, the pressure hasn't started yet, as I see. They haven't got into the boat for the first uh, qualifying session. and. As we know from the past, qualifying is a big advantage because the guy that gets pole position here has the shortest run into the first turn, boy. It's a big advantage. The only thing I think we're going to see here more than we've seen in the past, because it's a far more open circuit, we talked about that when we spoke about the circuit earlier on, there's going to be some great opportunities for overtaking, even though those times, as we saw in free practice, I mean, between first and tenth, Steve, I think we were talking about less than a second. So they're so evenly matched out here. But I think the guys that can see opportunities like we saw Stark in Indonesia you know between him and Jonas Anderson on the stopwatch you could not split them all through practice through qualifying the whole weekend when it came to the race Stark said to me I've got to think of a way in which I can trick him and get past him on the first couple of laps because if he starts pulling away I've had it and you saw what happened came down past the start line came did a wide line through two and three um, Jonas was on the inside, Stark was on the outside, and of course, he then had the best line into the right-hander. He took that opportunity and he was away. Yeah, Ferdinand Sandberg and ruined all his plans after he barrel-rolled in the first lap. Yeah. All right, Luis Romero, who is the race director, has waved the green flag, and the drivers are starting to make their way out. As we talked about, 18 drivers from 13 different countries, nine race teams here. And uh, Luis is going to give them a chance to go around once or twice to get everybody out on the water and fair, and then he'll drop the green flag, and then we will start the 20-minute countdown for Q1. Now, remember, only 12 of the 18 will move on, so we'll keep an eye on who is uh, down uh, on that 12th of 13th spot, and uh, it'll determine uh, at the very end. It should be pretty exciting, but as I was talking about, the fast guys, Jonathan, should get out there, run fast early in clear water, and then get off the race circuit. And then the battle will really begin to see who's in the catbird seat trying to hold on to that 12th place position. Yeah, for the first three or four laps, it's going to be absolutely mirror calm here. And that is the time when you can really put down a good lap time. So the guys that are out there in the lead now, 
they're going to have a little bit of an advantage. And as then you said, Steve, sit back, see exactly how that field is panning out, whether you need to run again. I'm pretty sure they will because to all, towards the end of that first 20-minute session, people are going to start up in their game a bit. So it's all even Stevens as we speak at the moment. And I'll be honest, from those times that we saw in free practice this morning, it's anybody's guess who's going to get into the top six and get that pole position. Welcome to the 40th season of Grand Prix Racing here on the UIM Formula One World Championship, as we talked about with uh, Rusty Wyatt picking up the victory in his very first Grand Prix. He was not the first person to do that. It happened back in 1981 when Rata Molinari won the very first race. Then the next year, 1982, in a weekend that I know you were at in Bristol in England, Billy yeah. Siebold in his first race in Formula One won. And then in 1990, when you were there in Zolder, it was Don Johnston winning. So three drivers previous, but it just shows you how difficult and how rare it is to win in your very first Formula One race. Well, as you said, from 1990 to 2024, nobody has done it. So for Rusty to come here not knowing how he was going to do, didn't know anything about the competition. I've not even seen him at a Grand Prix before, but we've heard some good reports about his performances in North America in that championship. We knew he was going to be fast, but boy, we didn't think he was going to take his first win in Indonesia, that's for sure. Absolutely. Now the green flag has started. Less than 20 minutes to go, and now they're going to pound their way around. It'll be interesting to see what happens here as we zoom in on the front straightaway, where it's 546 meters down into turn number one past the start-finish line. And this is pure speed right here as you go onto the drone camera. You get a chance to look at the lovely city in the backdrop here. But the boats and their drivers are focused finally, talking to their radio uh, communication and getting the updates on what exactly is happening as we wait to get the first lap in on qualifying. This is an hour session with three different qualifying uh, sessions running in. As they come whistling by, into the turn they go down. You get a chance to see in the front straightaway, there's uh, Bartak Marzowak, the driver from Poland to won his very first race back in uh, 2023. There's the driver who's back. He was missing in the first race. That's Ahmed Al-Fahim, who uh, was docked a race after uh, he and uh, Sean Torrente got into a mix-up, and the officials determined that he was a bit of the cause of the root cause of that. So he had to sit out a lap. Now, as we start, Rusty Wyatt goes to the top with a 46-8-8-3, it's early. Again, Jonathan, they're not playing their cards. They're playing the cards close to the vest. They're not going to give everything at once. But uh, Peter Moran now jumps into the top, so we expect to see a lot of this juggling early. Yeah, I had a chat with Peter just before they launched the board. I wanted to have a chat with him on the pontoon, Steve, but unfortunately he was, he was rather busy, and I didn't, didn't want to get in his way. But he said just before um, this session that he was really confident that they had some serious speed, Steve, and uh, watch out for him. All right, as we take a look at Ahmed Al-Fahim, the victory team, he is the oldest driver ever to start as a rookie in Formula One. It was, he's almost uh, 44 years old at the time. He is now 44 years old. And uh, for him, he's trying to chase down uh, some points. He's had two total starts. He's had two top tens. He's got three career points. So Ahmed Al-Fahim kind of on the back foot catching up early now. Yeah, he was saying, you know, uh, unfortunately he was unable to race in Indonesia because there was a collision between him and Sean Torrente at the final race of last year's World Championship. And uh, he was deemed to have made a mistake. And uh, unfortunately for him, um, obviously he couldn't compete in Indonesia. I had a chat with him yesterday. I said, so how are you feeling about this weekend? He said, well, I'm a bit apprehensive, as you quite pointed out. He said, you know, it's the first time back in the boat after a horrendous accident that he had there with Sean Torrente. And he said, so I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to build up my speed and hopefully I'll be there at the end. Cedric de Guin, the driver from France, driving with the team that he has put together, the Maverick Racing Team. He's tied for 15th. He picked up three points at the opening round in Indonesia. He is starting his 44th career race. And uh, for him, the last race of last year, Jonathan, he did well. He, he moved up his best of 2023, jumped six spots, finished up in 11th. But uh, chasing uh, points this year is going to be uh, a consistent battle for both drivers. 
he and that uh, teammate of his, Alexander Borgo. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got to give him credit. I mean, they, they've not got the best budget, but they are solid performers, aren't they, Steve? They're always there at the end, and they're running sort of midfield there or thereabouts. And, uh, you know, great to see them. Uh, they really are passionate about Formula One racing in France, and uh, so nice to see the, the guys doing so well out there. But back to the... Uh, the positions at the moment, Steve, sorry, I'll just come in there. Peter Moran leading the way from Wyatt. Bartek Marstak all of a sudden putting up a good performance in third. You take a look at the parking lot, Jonathan. They're out there just sitting around. Rusty Wyatt is in second, as you mentioned. Bartek right there with him. They're in no rush. They know what they've done. They're waiting for somebody else to try to uh, put some pressure on them. And if they slide out of the uh, top ten spots. Oh, no, there's a problem on the race circuit. Going over, what a shame. It looks like uh, one of the boats that had a chance over on the far side, Jonathan. A major surprise, and it looks like it's uh, number six, possibly. And that looks like it's, yeah, it's uh, Thani Al Quimsey who has oh gone over. Oh, wait a second. That No, that's Alberto Comparado. Oh, can you oh. believe it? Tell you what, Alberto Comparado, Jonathan, have, has been struggling. And, uh, you know, this is something that's starting to become a normality for him all of a sudden. What the yeah. heck? Dear. I mean, you know, he struggled a little bit in, uh, in the race in Indonesia, first time with, the, uh, with Team Abu Dhabi. And I had a chat with him this morning, and I said, how's everything going? Unfortunately, I think they had an engine problem first thing this morning. They had to change the engine. So he had a very limited amount of free practice out there. But he said, I'm fairly confident we can do well. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of damage on that boat, Steve. Uh, looks like he's out for the day. Yeah, engine change was a problem earlier. And you can see the left spots and torn a bit off the pickle for on. So Alberto Comparato, the young, talented driver from Italy who finished second in the uh, battle for uh, Rookie of the Year in 2019, second generation driver. Jonathan, he crashed out in Sharjah at the last round of last year. He crashed out in France in Macon, and uh, he crashed out in uh, Emilia Romana uh, a year and a half ago. So he is struggling to finish. If it's not a DNF, not a finish mechanically, it's uh, this problem. And there you see the bits and pieces that are left of that beautiful DAC boat that they're going to have to work awful hard to get the Italian youngster out there tomorrow. Steve, I mean, you know, we don't know exactly what goes on with the uh, team Abu Dhabi and what boats they're using, whatever. But I've got to say that uh, Sean, Sean Torrente last year, I'm pretty sure, was running that boat. And such an experienced driver seemed in my view, to be having one or two issues with the boat. It was devastatingly fast, but in tough conditions, it was such a handful. And my understanding is that that is the boat that uh, Comparato is running this year. Um, he's taken over as obviously one of, the, one of the drivers there with the Abu Dhabi team. And is he having those same problems or... We didn't quite see what happened there. Maybe we'll have some footage, Steve, of, of the incident to see exactly what happened. But there's a lot of damage on that boat. And I, I can tell you now, they've got a spare boat. Maybe it'll be a good move, Steve, for him to move to the spare boat where he may be a bit more comfortable in driving something which isn't quite so much on the edge. Yeah, as they take it back, as you mentioned, yeah, when that boat is spot on with the right conditions, it is lightning quick. But again, you got to really drive the boat and with focus 10 tenths of the time and you make a little mistake and boy you can see look at the left spots and totally halfway ripped from the uh, from up front in the stern let's see if we got a replay here as we get a chance to watch coming down toward the corner there and oh my he just came back and he blew the boat over he stalled it and then barrel rolled Jonathan he launched the boat got it up on its tail and blew it right over and then Barrel rolled to a stop. That was a wicked hard crash. Let's look at it again. There he goes. Comparado blowing it over and then coming and turning the boat as it goes through. A couple of uh, gyrations and coming to a stop. I mean, f trying to find a little bit about that boat. And apparently it's incredibly wide in the tunnel. Very, very short. So it's, it, I mean, it, like you pointed out, Steve, it is a rocket ship. But to run it on the edge at maximum speed is a bit of a handful. And hey, for all we know, obviously he's going to change the boat for he's going to change the boat for tomorrow. That may be a good thing, yeah. you know. It may, maybe the new boat that they're going to put him in for tomorrow might be a little bit easier to drive than that one. Yeah, let's take a look, Jonathan. I think we've got the full video here. If we can see the whole accident as he came down his front straightaway, and uh, 546 meters. I'll tell you what, though, he's got a history 
of having access. Let's go back and take a look at a few of these here. This is in the last year and a half that he's had problems in uh, finding the right formula driving on the edge. And um, here on board, you can see him going off the race circuit here as he cuts across and goes over in the corner. And um, that, I believe, was in San Nazaro as uh, he did that a couple of years ago. And um, yeah, it's, it's funny how some drivers can really just find the edge and hold it while others are always searching for it. And uh, here in Macon, you get a chance to watch the uh, young Italian driver coming by. This was last year, literally stuffed it, launched it off away, and then nosed it in on the race circuit enough to where it ended his day. The Osprey rescue team submarined that boat into the corner. Oh my, did he take a wicked hit? And um, yeah, so you can see that part of it, Jonathan. And there he got tied up as he and uh, uh, one of the uh, Charger team boats got wrapped up. Was that Philip Roms as the two of them went into the corner down in turn number two. So I hate to say it, but it's becoming a bit of a, a historic, uh, you know, uh, acronym for him right now. He's going to have to need to uh, get his confidence back. I think he's losing it as these different incidents continue to crawl into his psyche here. He's going to have to tone it down just a little bit. As you talked about uh, Team Abu Dhabi, uh, you know, they they can take so much. And then, you know, eventually, uh, you know, they're going to have to do something to, to get him back in the straight and narrow because right now it's not looking good for the uh, young Italian who's got so much talent waiting for him as he's been nothing but successful all the way up into Formula One. Yeah, apparently Capolini told me, oh, I think it was sometime in Indonesia, I said, how's he getting on? And he said, he's so consistent, his times are perfect, his cornering is, is outstanding, he's, he's really on top of his game, and, uh, you know, it's so unfortunate that things like this happen, and uh, as you say, it'll, it'll probably hit his confidence a little bit, but... Uh, He'll be back. They've got a spare boat. He'll be back in another boat uh, for the event tomorrow. Obviously, for the uh, main event, he's going to have to go now to the back of the field and uh, try and work his way forward on Sunday, and that's going to be no mean feat. And just a reminder for everybody, this 20-minute session, the clock is still running, and we're down to 8 minutes and 43 seconds to go. So the people who are on the bottom of the list, look at Jonas Anderson, the driver who is our current world champion. Jonathan, Jonas Anderson has not started this session. This is huge if yep. he can't get out there and uh, get out to run. But, uh, you know, the wily veteran from Sweden will get a chance to get out there and push. And uh, looks like uh, possibly, hey, he's back out there. So just as we mentioned, he hasn't uh, been out there running. He is now, and he's got uh, eight minutes to and change to try to get himself up into the top 12, which should be very easy for the man who's the two-time world champion. Yeah, the other thing is, Steve, now that they're obviously getting that debris off the circuit, the water's settled down a little bit again. So Jonas is obviously going to position himself in a good slot so that he can get some clear water now on this one lap that he needs to move into the next session. Uh, this morning, to give people a bit of an idea and free practice, I mean, my God, he was devastatingly quick. And he was really between him and Eric Stark. And he calls Stark is, is almost like his adopted son, he tells me, because they used to live together. And he was saying that there is a ding-dong battle. They love each other, they're friends, but at the same time, on that water, they were just sharing that top position, weren't they? Stark would get the quickest time in free practice. Then he went to Jonas, back to Stark, back to Jonas. So it's a ding-dong battle going on between those two Swedes. Yeah, most drivers right now are sitting motionless with engines off between turn number three and four over here on the uh, northwest side of the race course. And uh, am, I, am I imagining a fishing pole coming out on one of these drivers? Are they, uh, they got time to kill right now. They're just, <laughs> yeah, they're just like waiting for something to happen. So it, let's see where we are, Steve. So Moran's leading the way from Wyatt, who won the last race. Bartek Marsalak definitely opened his... Uh, uh, opened uh, his weekend's uh, timing really well with that third spot and Marit. All right, fourth. green flag, we're underway. Let's get back racing here. Less than seven minutes to go. The top 12 only move on. And with 18 drivers from around the world here and uh, pushing hard. You get a chance now to see the V8 of Marit Stromoy as uh, 
you talked about she's up into the top five right now looking strong can she hold it though that's the question as everybody knows at desperation time and now they've adjusted the clock Jonathan they've moved it back to over 15 minutes so they've given oh. back the time so that really opens the door for a lot of the bottom feeders who are going to try to get up into the top 12 a better chance and they won't be so desperate in getting up into the top 12. So as we speak, Steve, it's still the Ram there in the lead. Nice to see Sammy Selyoff in sixth at the moment, doing a great job out there. We haven't seen Sammy shining for quite some time. Stefan Arand, um, Jonas's teammate, that young 21-year-old driver, very talented, come through from the smaller classes, been racing for many years now in second slot. Great job. Great strum all you see her on the screen right now. She's tied for six in this championship at 11 points. This is her 16th season, as we talked about prior to this, starting her 99th race. She does have a victory. She she won a big race in Sharjah in 2016 to end the season. First woman ever in professional racing, whether it's on land, on sea, you know, in the air, whatever. She uh, conquered that, and she became a huge celebrity in Scandinavia when she was able to do that as Peter Moran goes to the top. And she uh, continues on. She's a professional entertainer. And uh, with that, she uh, continues to uh, look for her first win in 37 starts as Rusty Wyatt is up into the top five. Brett Dillard jumps up into the top six. He's there. We spoke a little bit to him this morning. They put a bigger drum, a steering drum, on the boat, which means he doesn't have to steer, take, turn the steering wheel quite so much on the corners, but he said it was so temperamental. You had to just move the wheel the slightest amount, and all of a sudden you were turning. They then went back to the old drum that he had, the old steering drum, much smaller, gave him more control, and he's up in lap six at the moment doing a good job. Yeah, I was uh, talking with RJ West when he was on the headset with... Uh, Brent Dillard and he was talking about how he was struggling with it so they went back as you mentioned the old system now Jonas Anderson has jumped up to number two so we're not worried about the world champion right now he's got his act together even though he hadn't come out and, and ran any laps in the first eight minutes or so but um, his teammate now has gone a little bit quicker as he's about uh, seven one thousandth of a second faster than the uh, Wiley veteran from Fruvi Sweden Peter Morale, the driver from France and the uh, China CTIC team is in that number one spot so far. And uh, any surprises, Jonathan Dillard's in sixth. Reed Strummel up in the top ten. Now let's talk about who's on the catbird seat. Ahmed Al-Fahim's in the 12th spot. Ferdinand Zandberg and his continues to struggle a bit. I'm surprised, you know. He shows a lot of talent. He's won a race already, but this year and the end of last year, he kind of got drifting off into orbit somewhere. He's trying to get it all back down. He's down to 11. Yeah, this morning he was about a second and a half quicker than that, Steve, so I don't know whether he's got some sort of kind of technical problem or whatever, or is he binding his time, but uh, 12 minutes to go to the end of the session, he's certainly going to have to up his game if he wants to move into the second uh, te the second qualifying session here. Get a chance now to take a look at the Portuguese veteran, and that's Dwart Benevente. Last year, he didn't get any points, and uh, currently down in that 14th position. He picked up three points in uh, Indonesia. So, really for him, looking for his first win in 161 race starts. But I'll tell you something, he's a competitor. And uh, for him, he's got six podiums in his career. And... Uh, He's just having fun out there doing the best he can. And he, he continues with he and Ben Joff, the youngster out of uh, the UK, trying to improve. There we go back with Team Abu Dhabi. And there's Thani Al Quimson. You talk about a veteran, Jonathan. Thani's starting his 154th race. He's got 10 victories. And he's trying to uh, make some noise here this weekend. But he's struggling a bit. He's down in the 13th spot. And the difference between the two is about three tenths of a second for him to hop, skip, and jump over Ahmed Al Fahim, who is, you know, a driver who's only had uh, two professional starts. This is his third technical start, and uh, he didn't qualify, of course, in uh, Olbia in Italy last year. So this would be his third starting position. Yeah, he's coming around now. He's just going to finish off another lap, Farley. There, let's see whether he's improved his time. He's coming through now a couple of seconds to go to the end of the lap. Down through that lap he comes. 
moved up to 10th. So he's making a bit of progress, but he's still... I mean, you're talking 45.5, Peter Moran, and Fanny Alquamzi there, you know, 47-1. So there's still quite a gap between him and some of these lead drivers. Yeah, Thani is hoping to get himself in a position to get up into the top six. And for the 73rd time, as again, you look at Dwight Benevent, and uh, for him, he is uh, hoping to, in his career, get up into the top six. This would be his 30th time, if he ever gets into Q3, to get the run for pole position for this veteran from Portugal. Yeah, he's just running around the outside now, probably waiting for a bit of clear water ahead of him to see whether he can post a lap. I did have a chat with him in the airport after finishing the race in, uh, after flying back from uh, Indonesia. And he was saying, they've changed the format of these engines a little bit. Now, the RPM has been dropped a little bit. That that's the revs per minute. Um, and he said, because he's running a certain type of engine, because they've lowered the compression, the new rules mean that the compression of the engine is a little bit less. It really has made a big difference to some of his equipment. And he just can't seem to get that engine to be on song. And that's why you can see that he's down in that 16th slot at the moment. Yeah, again, Thani Al-Quimsi, the native... 45 years old out of Abu Dhabi, and uh, he is one of only uh, a couple of drivers. He's, a, he's got the third most experience. This is his 22nd season of racing. It's hard to believe. We remember when he was a rookie. He got uh, points. He got on the podium in just his fourth race ever. So, uh, And he picked up a slew of victories. Uh, he and Ahmed al Hamli, who we want to wish all the best to, who is uh, fighting uh, a bit of a battle himself. Uh, and we... Uh, we miss him and uh, give him a big hug, and we hope he's doing well. Ahmed al Hamli, one of our favorite people in Abu Dhabi. Hopefully he's watching today and watching his friend Thani al Quimsi has jumped up into the top five. So uh, right now, Team Abu Dhabi has one driver up there. Well, they've lost the other boat, Alberto Camperano, in case you missed it just earlier. He crashed out in a violent way as he launched the boat, stood it on its tail, stalled it, and then barrel rolled to a stop and uh, damaged the left spots and severely, so they're going to have to work in overtime. Yes, they have a spare boat, but they better hope it doesn't change as you take a look now at uh, Ferdinand Zandbergen down in the 11th position. He's barely hanging on, holding off Great Stromoy, who's dropped. Yeah, she's in the 12th spot, and then uh, behind her is uh, Ahmed Al-Fahim, who was in the 12th position. He slid down a position, so he is desperately trying to look for air and try to get up into the top 12, Jonathan. This is going to be a ferocious fight for the last five, six positions here as we get down under the five-minute mark. Yeah, another guy that's doing quite well out the, the, uh, there at the moment, Steve, is the young British driver, Ben Gell. Move up to fifth position. We saw a good time from him this morning, so slowly but surely he's working his way up the field. Yeah, this kid's got a lot of talent. He's got a great resume as uh, he has won 16 British championships and uh, started off, well, here I am, I'm trying, I'm learning, and now all of a sudden the kid's is looking great, and uh, it would be great for the, for the UK and uh, for him who lives in uh, Kent, in Maidstone, actually. He's 23 years old, one of the youngest drivers on the tour. He's got a wealth of uh, a future, I think. Yeah, and you know, he's the only British, if you go back sort of in my day, there was about 10 oh, British drivers crazy. competing in Formula One. And, uh, you know, it's nice to see another Brit out there again and uh, doing a great job still in that fifth position. So looking looking good so far for, for the weekend. Yeah, this is our uh, 301st event, Grand Prix in the history of the sport. And the British drivers over the years, in these last 40 years, have won over 32 uh, uh, Grand Prix, and you guys dominated, as you said, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, yeah. and then it kind of slipped away, and now they're trying to rebuild the momentum and get more UK drivers involved. That would be so much fun if we could get more uh, British drivers back on board. It was, but I mean, in my day, to be honest, I mean, there was, there was so much power world racing going on in the UK. We used to have about six or seven national races with massive fields, uh, a load of international races there, some of the world championships were run there, and uh, you know, unfortunately over the 20 years, it's pretty much died to death, and, uh, and that's sad, but uh, 
you know, nice to see, as you say, uh, another Brit up there. And, uh, yeah, holding his own at 46.03. So he's not that far off, Steve. Where is he? 0.4 of a second off the run. He's leading the way as we speak. Yeah, no, looking good. As you had a chance just a second ago to see one of the victory team boats. Looks like they're going to make an engine change or make a prop change. Now getting close to that five-minute mark, the magical time as you look at Ben Jelf continue to cruise around in that fifth spot. And uh, you look at a guy like him right now, Jonathan. He's in fifth. He knows he's got to be in the top 12. And for him, the difference between uh, that position is about uh, seven-tenths of a second. So how would you play it? Would you stay out there and keep pounding or, like, back off a little bit and just keep cruising around and stirring up the water? Or what are you doing? Well, he's just got to be aware of what's going on around him, you know, because we've got four minutes 48 to the end of the session. And like we saw in Indonesia, we saw about 15 changes in the last five minutes of this session. So anything can happen. So he's just got to be careful. He's got to watch out. He's dropped down to sixth. Wyatt is now up to fourth. Seemed to be struggling a bit. But we've got Moran, Stefan Moran, and Jonas leading the way. All right, let's talk about Amade Hall of Fame. Now, he was in 12th position. He's dropped down to 15th. So he's coming out. He made a propeller change. We're going to see what he can do. Desperate. He's down to about four minutes left to go, Jonathan. This will be his uh, exploring lap, and then he'll go hard the next time around. He won't have many laps left, though. No, the other thing is in free practice, they had to change the engine because there was some technical problem right. with it. So they had to take the power head off, put another one on, and he felt that, you know, it's going to take him a little bit of time to get that engine dialed in, to get it running at maximum power. So he is a little bit on the back foot, and as we say, he had that incident, so maybe a bit of a lack of confidence, maybe for the first sort of, you know, for the first 20, 30 laps of, uh, of testing. But uh, let's see what he can do now over the next three minutes, 41 seconds. Yeah, this driver, I'll tell you something, over the years, he was really into cars and he loved racing in the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenges and the Emirates Desert Rallies, but at the same time, he loved powerboat racing, so he made the switch from cars to boats, and now he's trying to get up into the 12 uh, top spots right now and uh, make it on to Q2 here as we check the time. Just over three minutes left to go as you watch him come whistling by. He's got a bit of traffic in front of him, though that's not going to help him at all. As, uh, we watch him go through turn number one and two. He was telling me, Jonathan, Ahmed was saying that the complex here, four, five, and six for him was the toughest to get right. Ah, the right. far west side of the race course coming up uh, almost here. And as the boats slow down, the yellow flag has come out. Yellow flag with uh, less than three minutes to go. And as we quickly uh, look around the race circuit, don't know. Could be debris, could be uh, somebody stopping uh, in a harm's way. But uh, at the moment, we're uh, wondering why we've got the yellow flag out. Could be a uh, driver over in the far side, but it looks like he's out of the way, Jonathan, over yeah. on the north side of the race course. So not quite sure what's going on. I'm looking at the Osprey boats. They certainly haven't moved off station. So nothing's, no boats have gone over. And then I'm looking at some of the tow boats because we use jet skis right. to get boats and off the circuit, moving. and they're not moving. So yeah. That's a good sign, actually. That's a great sign there. that they're not moving. Now, slowly, the Osprey boat is heading over toward turn number one. It could be drifting, you think, Jonathan? There's two buoys down there. Uh, maybe the race director. Now, Luis Ribeiro, who's the race director from Portugal, many years, he's a, he does a great job here. It was in Indonesia... Jonathan with about four or five laps to go he noticed that the right hander one of the two were drifting and to a point where he was you know throwing balls in the air deciding should I put out the yellow and if he did that would have stopped the race and it would have been over because it would have taken at least three or four laps to get everything squared away so he kept an eye on it and yes look at this that's exactly what's happening the uh, turn buoys must be drifting and he wants to make it fair you know you set it by GPS coordinates and uh, you don't want the last uh, two or three minutes where the course all of a sudden becomes shorter than what everybody else was running. So what they're going to have to do now, the question is, you know, did the anchor come off? I can see, Steve, they've got a rope and then there's a chain on the end of that yep. rope. And normally then they've got a big concrete block. And it has the chain come away from the block? I'm just trying to see. You can see them pulling, pulling that chain in over the side. Obviously, it must have moved because they wouldn't be uh, 
they wouldn't be in that position at the moment. Uh, whether a, a, a boat had maybe glanced against one of the turn boys and the propeller actually cut the rope, that does happen from time to time. Yeah, going back to Indonesia, the problem we had in Indonesia, that it was about a mile deep. And they said they've never had to put concrete blocks to hold those turn boys in uh, such deep water, you know? They were running out of rope, I remember, when they were setting the circuit because they had to go down so far. And that did cause a bit of an issue there over the weekend. But uh, we're back to Osprey there now, having a look over, Steve. They're just out of sight from us, but uh, obviously they're trying to get that back in. Now, the big issue then, Steve, is they've got to put it bang in the same place, otherwise that could alter a lot of these times. Yeah, very important here. Let's reset. We want to welcome you here on a lovely, hot, hazy morning. We are in uh, Tainé Bay here in the lovely city of Cunion for the second round of the UIM from Lone World Championship at the inaugural Grand Prix of Binh Dinh, Vietnam. Now, we've been coming here this for our first time ever in the 40-year history. We race here in Vietnam, and Jonathan, you and I came here uh, early in the week, and boy, it's just, it's stunning, the area around here. It's so lovely and uh, not only historic, but the beaches are pristine, and this is a true tourist area. Yeah, I mean, you the other morning, perhaps, you went to some of the temples, didn't you, in the area? Um, they built these Buddha temples uh, up on the tops of the of the mountains around here, and oh, my goodness, they do really look spectacular. And uh, yeah, you know, like you said, great place to visit, good place for a holiday, no question about it. Jonathan, yeah. getting word, Q1 is over. That's it. It's official. The flag came out. They've got to spend a little time with the Osprey rescue team getting themselves back into position. You can see as they're moving how much farther that that those pins were as they were drifting seriously from the southwest with the wind coming from that direction going toward the uh, northwest coming from the southeast so you can see that it really moved a lot so they finally said hey time out let's get the buoy back in place then we'll do q2 yeah and they do have what we call gps coordinates that sounds a bit technical but i when they set the circuit if at any time the turn boys do move in any direction they will know because they've got GPS senders on each of these boys. So what they're going to be doing now is they're going to, obviously, they, uh, they're going to have to put a new block on the, on the bottom of those boys, take it back out there, get that coordinate, drop it back in, and hopefully that'll be bang in the position it was in prior to the boys moving, which is going to be very, very important coming into the next session. All right, let's take a look at how they... Uh the uh, bottom feeders, the unfortunate six who didn't make it in there. Philip Roms, the driver from Finland, finished uh, in the 13th spot for the Charger team. He will not move on. Either will the Frenchman, uh, Alexandre Bourgeau. He is not going to move on. As you take a look at some of the uh, top uh, six uh, fastest times thus far, Peter Moran has uh, set a really fast time of a 45.59. The quick time this morning in practice, however, was a 44.6 by Jonas Anderson. So again, everybody playing their cards close to the vest, not giving you everything yet because we've only gone through Q1. As you see the top six so far, no surprises there. And um, Alexandre Borgo. Also down in the 14th spot, as you see, Eric Stark, he made it in. Ben Jelf, the UK driver, an eighth. Good run for him. Ferdinand Zandbergen slid up into the ninth spot. That's good. Daniel Quimsey slid into the 10th spot. Sami Celio hung on after being up in the top five. He slid down to the 11th, but he's in. And Marit Stromoy of Norway. And here are the unfortunate drivers who will not go on. And the hopes and dreams of a pole position for Sunday's Grand Prix are gone. Philip Roms uh, with the Charge team, Alexander Bourgeau, uh, Ahmed Al Fahim, who's up to 12th, slid down into the 15th spot. He couldn't get a good, clean lap when he put on a new prop. Dwarf Benevent uh, in the 16th position, Cedric Deguin in the 17th spot, and of course Alberto Camparado going out in a huge, spectacular way down at turn one when he aired the boat out. He launched it, he stalled it, he barrel rolled it, he tore it up, and now it's like, oh, now what do I do? Yeah, and I've got to say, when you look at those drivers, some of them, I mean, you know, obviously Comparato turned the boat over. But one guy I don't feel that should be in, to the, in that last session is Philip Roms. I watched him this morning in free practice, and I, for some reason the boat does not seem to want to run on the water. It's not performing as he wants it to. And unfortunately, that's put him on the bit of a back foot there. So hopefully, Steve, he'll be able to find what those gremlins are in the boat or the engine or whatever it is. And we'll see him back where he 
deserves to be, in my opinion, which is definitely in the top ten. All right, the young Italian with Team Abu Dhabi, Alberto Camparada, who was third quick in practice this morning, had high hopes to get a chance to run for his uh, pole position. He's got one in his career, and he was whistling down the front straightaway, Jonathan, at uh, well over 500 meters, 546 meters. And then this happened as he went down into turn one. You can see him to the right of your screen. He launched it as he tried to set the boat, and he ended up uh, barrel rolling it to a stop after he stalled it. And the airplane took off. It looks like an airplane, and he uh, barrel rolled to a complete stop. And he could see the violence of this crash as he couldn't set the boat correctly. It came back on itself and then barrel rolled and it tore it up pretty good. Dead right, Steve, you've got it right there. He was going down the straight. He was The boat was absolutely at maximum speed. And then you have to trim the engine in a little bit, which brings the front of the boat down and allows it a corner. And you could see that the boat, he trimmed it in. It came down quite violently. And then, of course, it bounced back up came up at about 30, 40 degrees. The air got underneath it and blew the boat over. Well, you have just saw what uh, the remains of the boat looked like. Even though it was getting towed in, you couldn't see the whole bit of damage on the boat. But you've been a long-time boat builder and constructor yourself. You look at that. A, how long is it going to take to fix that boat? And B, what do you think the cost is to fix something like that? Well, the cost of DAC is really just the materials. But as far as repairing the boat is concerned, I mean, you know, it's a long shot for them to repair that for the weekend. If you've got another boat, as Team Abu Dhabi have, I've seen one out the back there, which is pretty much ready to go. My guess would be that they're just going to put him in that other boat for him to run the weekend. Then, obviously, everything is shipped back to Europe, all the containers. The boat will go back to Europe. It'll all be repaired in their factory in uh, Como in northern Italy and be ready, ready to go again for the next event, which uh, um, my understanding is going to be in Sardinia and Albia, which uh, we're all looking forward to. Yeah, we're all looking forward to going to Albia. Should be a lot of fun. Here's some nice slow-mo images of what we had. There's the man who's the fast time so far, Peter Morin of France, who's really more of an endurance racer than anything else. But over the years, he's gotten to be faster and faster. This is his seventh season and uh, currently ninth with eight points in the championship. And uh, again, as we said, he got penalized. He finished in 11th. And here's a driver who was a, a rookie a year ago who's back only for his third start of his career in his second season as Ahmed Al-Fahim uh, was docked a race for uh, an incident that he had in Sharjah to end the season. And again, coming out of a lovely turn number six, coming down the front straightaway, that's uh, Marit Stromoy as the... Uh, professional entertainer, the woman from uh, Norway, driving that V8 uh, Mercury engine, that uh, four-stroke, uh, looking solid as she went by. It's interesting how the noise of that engine is so different than what the V6s are. But uh, uh, again, here you get a chance to take a look at Team Abu Dhabi. And um, yeah, that's Thani El Quimsey's 22nd season of racing. And uh, Thani came up, and uh, he did fairly well, Jonathan. He, uh, he's, he's up in there and uh, going on to Q2, which is great for Guido Capellini and Team Abu Dhabi. They needed somebody to get into at least Q2, so he's made the mark. And he's got 10 victories, as I said, on his career, so uh, pretty good driver. And then, of course, for uh, the Atlantic team, uh, they have uh, good drivers, and uh, including uh, the veteran, Duarte Benevente, and then the youngster, Ben Jelf, the... 23-year-old from Maidstone, England, who's got three top tens with just eight starts in his career. He's tied for fourth in this championship with 11 points. So uh, he started off this year qualifying eighth, finishing eighth. So, uh, so far, so good. He continues to impress, Jonathan. Uh, this kid, I think, has got a good future ahead of him. Yeah, so who do we see moving through into the top six, Steve? I mean, from what we saw this morning, Jonas Anderson. Stefan Arand, a young driver uh, from, I believe, Latvia or Estonia? Estonia. Estonia. Yeah. I do beg your pardon. Yeah, okay. I mean, just come into Formula One, he had that opportunity. Jonas was looking for a second driver over the winter. And he was telling me yesterday, they looked at it and they said, are we ready for Formula One? They've done a great job in Formula Two, but they did want another season in Formula Two. But the opportunities like that don't come up that often. 
and uh, they committed themselves and I think it's going to be a great move for that young driver because not only is he with a top team, Team Vietnam, but he's also with a top driver. Yeah. He's going to learn a lot from him. Absolutely. Steve. I mean, you've got to, you join a world championship team that won the world championship in the team division. Then you've got Jonas Anderson, as you said, the world champion. Why not? I mean, how can it get any better than that? And you're going to find out right away how good you are because you're going against the driver who possibly could be the best uh, talent on this uh, 2024 campaign. So, Stefan Arndt, he's a great kid. He's, he's still in university. He's only 21 years old. He's got a lot of common sense. He comes from a great family. And uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what his future is in this sport. But right now, he's been impressive. And, uh, of course, uh, Eric Stark, uh, yeah, we talked about who can move on. I mean, this top 12 is very, very, uh, very, very strong. It's going to be tight, Wow, Steve. look at that. There's the damage. A good look at uh, standing right over the top. And you can see literally the left Sponson over on the right of your screen is totally gone except for the back half. And uh, look at the damage up front, too. It just tore up the boat as it, it was twisting through the water Jonathan and it was torpedoing around and uh, you can see what the what it does to the paint and um, the wrap and the whole thing it's uh, it's gonna be a long involved process these guys got a lot of work to do yeah and Steve as we know all these boats are built from carbon fiber incredibly strong and I mean normally the boats are taken off the water what obviously empty all the water out to them get the engine back running and they're back on the uh, back for the next session but I mean that must have been quite a violent accident there to have ripped off that sponson and uh, knowing how these boats are actually constructed as you look the crew is now holding off for the gaff sticks with the drivers getting them in place ready to go 12 uh, boats are ready to come out in anger as uh, they are hoping to get the pole position there you see one of the uh, drivers who was not his boat was not able to get up into the run for the pole position Andre uh, Bourgeau of France and uh, he's from uh, near Rayon and uh, and you can see uh, his teammate there Cedric de Guin and uh, all the... seven foot of him Steve yeah, my goodness guy. he's a monster yeah. guy. but you really talk about the De Guin family these guys have put together such a, a, a great tradition and they put together the last couple of years uh, uh, they built the package to have us go to Macon in France on, uh, and getting a, a good run for a couple of years I mean this year the the Olympics uh, going on in Paris, so it was a bit of a struggle to get in there this year. But I'll tell you something, they they worked 12 months of the year for two years to make sure the event in Macon went well. And it was a lot of fun to go to that region of France. Yeah, it was. I mean, his, his father was really the guiding light there that convinced uh, the government to uh, support a Grand Prix in, uh, in Macon. And, uh, it was just a great venue, no question about it. The French are really, I mentioned earlier, really passionate about powerboat racing. And uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be there this year, but uh, hopefully we'll be back in France very, very soon. And unfortunately, Ahmed Al-Fahim of the victory team is going to be a spectator, Jonathan, and uh, watch these next uh, two sessions as his boat there comes out of the water and goes back into the paddock area. This is the 19th time in the history of the 40 years that we have come to Southeast Asia. And uh, interestingly enough, we talked about it yesterday, Jonathan, that uh, only one family, one family has had both the father and the son win races in Formula One. Who would make that be, Steve? I have no idea. Bill and Mike Siebel. Okay. And they yeah. did it in the same year. The Americans did it in 1994. Jehoa Baru, Mike Siebold won. Jonathan Jones finished in second. Nice going, buddy. Made the podium. And then later on in Thailand, Billy won the race, the father. Guido finished second. And Michael Werner of Germany, who's uh, always one of our favorite people, finished third on the podium. So not bad. Second place, my friend. That was uh, good. Must have been lucky that day. Oh, yeah. Well, you've got one win, two uh, runners up, and you got three podiums in uh, 19 starts. Oh, all okay. 19. Close to that, yeah. All right, as we get set to go, we're set for Q2, ladies and gentlemen. 15 minutes, we got 12 combatants here. We're gonna whittle it down to six, and then we'll have Q3 and a 10 minute flat out run for pole position. But the heat's turning up, Jonathan. It's getting hotter and hotter. We're down to the top 12. Not only the heat, the engines are gonna be turned up, Steve. 
because now they're going to get a lot more horsepower out of these engines. They're going to fine-tune them a lot more for this uh, this uh, next session because those top drivers need to get in the top six. They need to get that pole position. And this is where Jonas is really, he's bang on the money because not only is he a boat builder, which he works with uh, uh, a, a Danish boat builder in uh, creating these Formula One craft, um, he actually rebuilds the engines, he tunes them, he's got a dyno shop in, uh, in Sweden. So he is the full package and he drives the boat. So when it comes to tuning engines, as a driver, he knows exactly what he's looking for. So he goes into the, uh, into the workshop, he tunes the engine, he then puts it on the boat, he tests it, and he can feel whether it's making progress or not. And that is a big advantage if you are able to do that. Absolutely, and these conditions here are totally different than what they were a month ago when we opened up the season in Lake Tuba up in uh, northern Sumatra in Indonesia. We were uh, 1,000 meters up or 3,000 feet. Uh, thinner air, now we're down exactly to sea level. We're actually three meters. Well, you and I are about four meters off the water, but uh, three meters according to uh, the uh, statistics here. And uh, salt water, we're on sea level. It's a totally different program. Yeah, when we were in Indonesia, we were at altitude, and obviously uh, we were on fresh water. And the boats don't have as much lift, so they don't have as much acceleration because the air is thinner. And the engines don't produce the power because they can't get that, that good, solid air into the engines to produce the power. All and right. uh, coming here, a little bit different, so the setup is quite different. We're into the green flag, Steve, and uh, Jonas flying by there, putting up one of the, one of the quickest times as we go around he's in the top end of the city. Yeah, Peter Moran jumped it perfectly. He got it just at the right start. He's got clear open water. Let's see what the Frenchman can do with Jonas Anderson, the two-time world champion, right behind him, hounding him, trying to close up, but they've got a lot of open water, and can they take advantage of it as we watch the driver from southern France work his way down around turns number four, five, and heading down into six and down the front straightaway. We're holding our breath, getting our first lap here of this 15-minute session. Peter Moran, 44.88. Jonas just behind him. What's he going to do? 45.1. My goodness, Moran is flying out there, yeah. Steve. Yeah, that was uh, second quickest time uh, all day. Jonas set a 44.6 in practice, but now the conditions are totally different than what it was early in the morning. We were out here. As you watch on the replay, Peter Moran getting it just dialed in and had more boat build in France. The French driver coming around and uh, cutting through on the replay. And uh, interesting on lap number two, Jonathan, you got to kind of wonder what he was, hey, yeah. whether, whether he was celebrating or what. But uh, yeah, obviously, it, it, he it, looked like he almost lost control of the boat yeah. or something as he came down the straight. But at the moment, as we speak, he's on a 48. 44.88, Jonas in that second, 45. Rusty Wyatt hot on his heels, less than a thousandth behind. And Zanbergen, oh, I was going to say he was third, he's down to fifth, and Rusty Wyatt's in third. And now Eric Stark is into fourth. Nothing surprising here early on, Jonathan. Two Swedes, a Canadian, and a Frenchman up into the top four. And now Eric Stark slides down a spot where Sami Celio, the two time world champion from Finland, who won the title in a uh, impossibility in 2007 coming back and passing uh, Guido Capellini to win the title did the same thing beating out Jay Price the American with the last race of the year in 2010 so Sami Celio who has not won a race since 2016 there you see his boat as the veteran driver in his 26th year Jonathan this will be start number 166 for Sami Celio, who is up into that four spot. Yeah, good result, good performance there from Sami at the moment, slowly but surely working his way up back up the field. And uh, I do know that if everything is to his liking, that guy is probably one of the quickest guys on this circuit. Unfortunately, hasn't been able to show it for quite some time, but it looks like he's finding that mojo back and really pushing hard out here today. Yeah, he's tied for fifth in the championship with 11 points. He came off a qualifying effort of six he made it to the q3 session finished six in the race which for him was disappointing he hasn't won in 30 races so he's hoping against hope maybe the magic will come here in vietnam for him but right now as you mentioned 
It's uh, Peter Moran with uh, Anderson, Wyatt, Celio, and Stark in the top five. And uh, over on the far side, you get a chance now to watch Celio as he takes off, comes out of turn number two. As his crew uh, on the headsets chatting with him, making sure that uh, he knows exactly what's around him and what he has to do to go fast. Down through four, Steve. Let's just see how he can finish this lap. Boat looks a little bit erratic this time. Doesn't seem to be quite so smooth as the last time. But, uh, you know, maybe that time he's going to improve as he comes down past the start-finish line. Is he going to move up? Celio, we hold our nope. breath. He did not. He's still in that fourth-place position. He's driving a Baba boat, a bit flighty. But... Uh, Here's our other rookie. We've got two drivers fighting for rookie of the year. Stefan Arn, he is the driver from uh, Estonia, and uh, he qualified fourth in the first opening round race in Indonesia. Down in fifth right now. Eric Stark rounds out the top six. And Ferdinand Zandbergen trying to do his best, but there you see the youngster, the 21 year old that we've talked about from Estonia, uh, jumping on to the uh, Team Vietnam team with uh, world champion uh, Jonas Anderson and uh, he was driver of the year last year in Estonia as you can see his father chatting with him pushing him along and now uh, Ferdinand Zandberg and who's down in the seventh place he's trying to claw his way up into the top six so he's gonna have to put some magic together here he's Sami Celio's teammate with the Red Devil team Jonathan yeah, he had a back off there a little bit. There was a lot of traffic around him. He needs that clean lap. So he's coming around again, Steve, taking a big wide line there, coming out of the last turn. Let's see if he can uh, improve on that position. He's seventh at the moment. He needs to find about a half a second as he goes down through the start-finish line. Let's take over to you, Steve, to take a lap with him. As he takes it around turn number one, they readjusted it after it started floating away. It's 317 meters down into turn two, heading to the north side of the cross. Sweeping around a corner that's about 125, 130 degrees down into the long run of 329 meters to the right-hander and just sets it lightly and then pours on the power with 404 meters down into interesting complex. Four, five, and six, Jonathan. A little bit tighter. I imagine you take it around and then set it at five and then you sweep around six. What do you think as you yep. watch him come by? Yep, he's into five, come through five, come through six. Taking a good line there, down towards the start-finish line. Ferdinand, seventh at the moment. Yeah, same. Didn't change. No, didn't but no, change. I was saying, talk about the complex as they come through here. Uh, it's interesting how you've got three buoys in such a smaller... Do you sweep around these two and set, or, and then sweep through? What do you think, Jonathan? Well, I think when you come into four, you've got to let that boat set a little bit. And then in my view, and I mean every drive is different, what I would do then is I would get the boat right on top of the water, dead loose, maybe the last inch of the boat or even less, on the top, float it through number five, but keep it tight to the turn, float it through six, keeping it tight again, a little bit more trim, get a bit more air under the tunnel to get maximum speed down past the start-finish line. And I think that could work if you get it right here. All right, Peter Moran continues to sit up in that number one position. He's... Uh sitting on the throne right now of uh, being the man who is the fast time in Q2 so far. Plenty of time left, though. Just over uh, seven and a half minutes to go as you look at Thani Al Quimsey, the veteran driver from Abu Dhabi, who's got the only boat left representing Team Abu Dhabi as uh, Team Vietnam comes by. Stefan Arns finds himself uh, up into that fourth position. Eric Stark sliding to the fifth spot. So it's Celio barely hanging on as he's holding off his teammate right here, Ferdinand Zanbergen. As Sonny Al Quimsey went whistling by in front of us, but he didn't improve. So Zanbergen, who has won and uh, surprised a lot of people when he picked up a victory in only his first year after dominating back in 2022 when he won in Italy. 
And uh, since that time, though, he's struggled a bit. He's had uh, in the last year he had an accident, and then he had uh, a couple of DNFs. So he's trying to improve on it. Yeah, I watched Sergio there coming through the right hand on the far end of the circuit. He had good boat control coming through there. The boat hardly settled and was accelerating so well. He's at the moment between four and five. He's number six position as we speak, and uh, let's see if he can improve on that time. He's got some clean water ahead of him. He's thundering down the straight now, coming in past the start-finish line. And after all that excitement, didn't do it. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Rusty Wyatt's moved up into the third spot. No surprise there. That's exactly where he was in Q2 at the last race, and he ended up there in Q3 in third spot. So as you look at Daniel Quimsey, with uh, six minutes remaining here in this 15-minute session, don't run off because we got Q3 coming up next. That'll be the top six. That'll be 10 minutes of mayhem, as it should be ex pure excitement on the race course here in Vietnam. Thani looking for a second, Steve, if he needs to get into that top six at the moment. He's a little bit on the back foot. He's going to have to choose his water, make sure that there's no, no boats around him, there's no wash or anything, and he's got a clean lap coming into the... Is he slowed down again there? Oh, I thought he was going to come in for a fast lap. Oh, you can see Thani coming in, maybe the change of propeller whatever he's got five minutes and 18 seconds to go so if they're going to do something yeah you can see different propellers one of the mechanics they're going to change is that going to give him a little bit more speed a bit more acceleration and get him into that top six yeah i mean how fast can you change the prop it's pretty doggone quick you can do it if you have to Jonas anderson drops down to third eric stark goes to number one eric stark of sweden with the victory team finds himself in the first spot with a 44 4 1 4. And now Stefan Arand, the second driver for Team Vietnam, has pushed Jonas down to fourth position because he's up in third. What a great job from that young driver, 21 years of age, a good solid head on him. He's doing a fantastic job, Steve, I've got to say. And Rusty Wyatt has dropped two places. He's gone from third Ooh. down to fifth, so Rusty is hanging in there. He was up to third, he's down to fifth. Celio still sitting there in that sixth spot. As Brett Dillard moves up a spot, he was down in 10th, he's up into 8th, but he's running out of time. He's got just over four minutes to go. Yeah, Rusty, better watch it there because he's got people like Celio, who's more than capable of moving up. Fanny, we just saw them going into change of propeller. Is that going to be the answer to them getting into the top six? Time is going to tell. Four minutes to go to the end of the session. Things are quiet at the moment. People making changes. Celio going around. He's on a hot lap as he goes down into one. He is on fire as he goes down, heading into turn number two. His teammate right behind him, Stefan Aran, doing what he can, knowing that he is ahead of Sami Celio by two positions. So that Red Devil team is uh, trying to get up and get both boats in the top six for the shootout. Let's see how it pans out. He's into four, nice corner there, Steve. Gets the boat out and trimmed, accelerating well. He's through five, he's through six. He's looking for a minute amount of time. A couple of tenths is gonna help him get into the top six. He's coming down here like a rocket ship as he crosses the start-finish line. All right, let me look. Let's see what Sami Celio did. Did he move up? He did not, Jonathan. He's still down in six. He's still in the show, but just barely hanging on by his fingernails. As uh, his teammate fighting to go right up with him, Ferdinand Zandbergen trying to do what he can. And he is down in the seventh spot. So all of a sudden, the Red Devil team down in sixth and seventh place with uh, the Vietnam team up in uh, good steed with their third and fourth right now with less than three minutes to go. Two minutes and 40 seconds. The heat is being turned up, Jonathan. The drama's building. Here we go again. We're going from 12 to 6. Who is going to fail and who is going to pass and move on for a ball? Well, there's one or two there that can move up. There's no question about that. Although Sami, he's tried. I mean, we followed him for the last couple of three laps. And that time, he just cannot close that gap. He can find a tenth or so, but not quite enough to be able to move up to, let's say, the safety zone. Because he, ideally, he'd like to be up a third or fourth or whatever. All right, Rusty Wyatt jumped up to second, Jonathan, from fifth. He put in a flyer. He did a 44-835. 
He's four tenths of a second behind Eric Stark, who the victory team driver, the Swede, is having all sorts of fun. Jonas has slipped down a bit. He's down into fifth. Tommy Celio, so you got a couple of world champions down in fifth and sixth spot right now. Combine those with four world titles and both drivers hanging on right now with uh, a minute and uh, 40 seconds remaining, Jonathan, trying to get up into that Q3 for the pole position. Just picked up Marcel like there, Bartek. He's going through the right hand. He's on the far end of the circuit, Steve. He's got clear water ahead of him. Is he going to be able to move up? He's in eighth position at the moment. Both looks really well balanced on the water. He's carrying some solid speed. Yeah, but let's watch as Bartek comes through here. And uh, we'll see what he can do. Can he muster some kind of extra speed? Now, he made it up into the top six in Indonesia. He comes whistling by. Did Bartek move up? We hold our breath. He moves up to six. Wow. He got in there just enough. Now, Celio is going to have to answer, as is his teammate, Ferdinand Zandbergen, who are now seventh and eighth. So Bartak Marzowak, the driver from Poland, who made it to Q3 at the first opening round with less than a minute to go, is hoping against hope he can make it two in a row, getting to Q3 in 2024. As Jonas Anderson now knowing he's running out of time, everybody now on the race course pretty much down to their final lap here as Rusty Wyatt cruises by, just uh, fishing, relaxing, knowing he's going to be in the top six. Bartek knows, Steve, that it's not over. I'm just watching very carefully. He's taken a wide line coming out of number six. He's going for another lap. He's down past the south finish line. Is he going to be able to improve his time? He's got clear water ahead of him. All right, he's got Sami Celio, who's a little bit slower in front of him. Celio, I'm surprised. Celio's given up the ghost. I think he realizes he won't have enough time to get around. And Celio is not going to get into the top six of the two-time world champion. Driving that Red Devil boat will not go on and find himself into Q3. That's a shame for a driver. He's got 26 pole positions. Ben Jelf comes whistling by. He didn't improve. He's 12th out of 12. Disappointing for him. And there you see Ferdinand Zandbergen. He's down in that eighth position, but he's still out there running and technically can have a chance to finish up into the top six. Bartek Marswak in the sixth spot, coming across the line. Did he improve? Bartek trying to hold on desperately. He did not. He did a 45-118. And here comes Zandbergen. Can he find some speed, Jonathan? Can he get into the top six? Let's find out. We hold our breath. He comes whistling by, and he did not. No. What a shame. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I watched Bartek there. He wasn't quite in shot, but uh, the lap that he did that got him into that six was very, very smooth. And the lap after, I think he was just trying a little bit too hard to get that extra bit of time, extra bit of speed out of the boat. Couldn't quite do it. Well, we know the winners, the top six, it'll be moving on to Q3 in the battle for pole position here shortly with 10 minutes. But let's talk about the bottom six here. Any surprises here? Sully, of course, with 26 career poles, disappointing seventh. His teammate, uh, who has one lap on the year, as he barrel rolled in the first lap in uh, Indonesia, Brad Dillard moved from 10th up to uh, 9th. That's pretty much where he qualifies all the time. Thaniel Quimsey, he is struggling just a bit. He, for the year, uh, in the last uh, six races, Thaniel Quimsey, is uh, nine, he's averaging about ninth place. As you see Brett Dillard being towed back in, this is not a good sign. Dillard, hopefully, it doesn't have a, a very bad uh, problem with the boat or the engine because you don't want to have to replace the engine. Then you go to the back of the pack. So all that hard work, let's hope the American uh, can stay up into the top 10. Yeah, Steve, he ran 15 laps. And when you're out there doing these times, you're running fairly low on fuel. So fingers crossed, he, he basically got too low on fuel rather than have... Uh, another technical problem. Let's see where he was on the time. My good, I mean, he was so close, Brent. If he'd have found a couple of tenths, he'd have been right up there. All right, let's take a look at what we've got here for Q2, and we're anxious to get on to Q3. Let's take a look at the results that we had as uh, we welcome you for the first time here to Binh Dinh, Vietnam. We're having a great time here. Eric Stark, wow, a 44 4 1. This driver from Sweden is trying to make a statement here, Jonathan, saying, look, I've come runner-up in this championship 
once. I've been uh, in the top three two or three times. He's going to try to make a statement here. He's second in the championship. He's four points behind the man who's in second place. Rusty White has got 29 on the air. The young Canadian rookie who has got everybody's eyes wide open knowing that this kid can be really something in the future. He's starting uh, into that Q3 along with uh, Stefan Arndt. He is the second driver of the top two that are battling for Rookie of the Year. So as we talked about, Jonathan, uh, before, uh, three drivers in the last four years have dropped out of this championship and they took 10 world titles with them. So it's a new face for Formula One as Brett Diller down in the ninth spot, Sami Selu just missed out. His teammate missed out in the eighth spot. Then Thanio Quimsey 10th, eh, that's about where he's been the last year in qualifying. Marit Stromoy 11th and then Ben Jelf uh, 12th. So you look at the top six, it's under uh, under a second and then it starts drifting away. But uh, yeah, pretty good stuff at the end. and. Uh, the big thing, I think, yeah, overall, Eric Stark, that that was a bit of a, we expected him to be strong, but that is uh, quick. He's four-tenths of a second ahead of anybody else so far. Exactly, Steve. Um, but having said that, in Indonesia, uh, Stark and, uh, you know, Jonas, I mean, they led the field there by a country mile with uh, uh, Rusty Wyatt hanging, in, hanging on there in third. And those three drivers, in fact, I mean, they were like three-quarters of a lap ahead of the fourth place to thing so you know it's it's i don't know which way it's going to go i think the wired is the he's the dark horse here because we don't know too much about him we saw him win a race and he can certainly drive a boat there's no question um but it's going to be interesting to see how this one pans out is jonas is he do it been doing just enough to get into the top six i don't know when you're fifth you, you know you, you need a really pull your socks up a little bit. It'll be interesting say? to see if Wyatt uh, finds himself uh, in the middle of a Swedish pancake with uh, two Swedes on top like they were in Indonesia. Remember the difference between Jonas Anderson who got the pole at the first race and Eric Stark was just two one hundredths of a second mm -hmm. difference. So that's how close it is and we expect uh, the pair of Swedes who are like uh, we know the story now old friends and they are rooming together and so forth many years ago uh, know each other they respect each other and uh, will there be a dark horse like it meant uh, with uh, Rusty Wyatt who really nobody knew on the world tour about this North American driver who finished fourth in the standings last year in uh, the USA and uh, for him the Canadian uh, all of a sudden jumps into a boat he's never been in before a DAC brand and then uh, Ended up winning the race the first time around. So uh, we've got some great talent. Bartak Marzwak, hats off to him. He dug himself out of a late hole, jumped up into the top six, hung on the last two minutes, and Bartak made Q3 in Indonesia. So for twice for a driver who uh, struggled after winning the opening round a year ago, didn't get any points at all until the very last race in Sharjah when he picked up a pair. And now he's, uh, he's getting the confidence back. He's had all winter to get ready, and uh, he's, he's looking strong. Yeah, I was talking to, to a couple of his mechanics because he's, he's been through quite a bit recently and he's still going through a lot of stress. Uh, unfortunately, his daughter's not been very well, and, uh, you know, that, that seems to be taking up most of his time and maybe a little bit of the focus away from... Uh, from powerboat racing itself and uh, as you quite rightly said Steve it's great to see him back up there he put in a solid performance there I mean you know another couple of tenths and you would have seen him up in third or fourth so we know he can do it as long as his mind's focused and set at the job in hand you know so it'll be interesting to see where he ends up in this top six lovely uh Queen Eon, the city that we're in here in uh, Binh Dinh province of beautiful Vietnam. It is so spectacular and sparkling in the location that we're at. We're all excited about being here. It's not just the powerboat racing, the lovely, uh, friendly people, but also the beaches. My question now to you, Jonathan, is these drivers have been sitting in these boats, and they've been in there for over an hour and uh, probably about uh, 12 minutes now you got to go out and really perform for 10 minutes. I mean, how are you doing physically, mentally? And uh, you're not really getting much of a break, maybe a little bit of water, and that's it. It's all about mind over matter, Steve. Isn't it? You yep. forget about all the aches and pains, the fact that it's stiflingly yep. hot in the cockpit, and you just focus on that one lap. And you, you, now you're so on the limit out here now. The boats are almost like low-flying aircraft. They're just about to turn over going down the street to get into this top six 
it's it really is you're on a fine edge all the way around in fact i remember when i used to qualify at times i almost held my breath for half of the lap hoping that i could still keep that boat in control to be able to get that pole position which again as i said earlier means so much you've got that big advantage going into the uh, into the first corner you've got a you've got a perfect line nobody can cut you off people have to keep away from you they've got to keep their line off the pontoon but you've got the shortest run and if you can get in the lead then you can build up a gap because you'll have clear water ahead of you for probably 10 15 laps before you start coming up against the back markers i'll tell you what we're uh waiting for the winds to pick up actually they haven't here it was a big surprise as we take a look at the entry list here for the top six eric stark as we talked about the quick man so far uh, fastest lap of the weekend so far and uh, we'll see if he can hold on to that rusty wyatt who leads this championship in uh, the second uh, quickest and then uh stefan around the driver out of uh, estonia another rookie who is really impressing and then peter moran the longtime endurance racer in his seventh season getting uh pretty feisty here jonathan he's getting more and more uh, familiar with uh, sprint racing and he feels pretty good. Jonas Anderson, of course, what can you say about a guy who's won, uh, you know, four out of the last six races? And uh, Jonas Anderson trying to make a statement here as uh, Rusty Wyatt, the Canadian, is the first boat out. And uh, Scott Gilman, the Wiley four time world champion, team manager of Team Sharja, the Sharja team, sends uh, his driver out first. And uh, he wants him to have a, as clear a run as he can with just 10 minutes to go. The strategy changes, Jonathan. It's more uh, conducive to getting it done. And uh, it's, it's really a situation where you're almost panic time, but not quite yet. Exactly. You've got to pick your water as well here, Steve. And by that, I mean, you know, you've got to make sure that for that lap, that you've got nothing that's going to interfere. No wash off the other boats. No guys getting in, in your way, you know. So sometimes I used to sit on the far end of the circuit and wait for people to put their lap, let the water settle down, and then go for it, you know. But everybody's got their own idea, their own strategy. Um, the radio men will be that are on the bank here in timing will be in contact with these drivers. They'll be explaining exactly where they are on the circuit, um, whether there's anything that could impede their progress when they go for that uh, lap that could take them to pole position. Yeah, you and I go way back to New Orleans back in 1985. Uh, <laughs> Nassau in the Bahamas. <laughs> you were a crafty veteran, my friend, so I believe everything you say is... Uh, <laughs> Rusty Wyatt goes whistling by, and uh, the only problem is you had four Brits standing on the top podium. I don't know how the heck you got everybody up there to take that Harmsworth Trophy in Nassau. I think, I think that was a lot of luck, Steve. Uh, I mean, we, we, we were certainly on, our, uh, you know, on top of our game in those days. Yeah, no that's, about that. that's why we want to get more British drivers back in this series. So, everybody getting a chance to warm up their lap before uh, race commissioner Luis Ribeiro. Uh, Hits the uh, green flag and we start the countdown. This is for pole position. Who will start number one for the second round of this championship here at the Binh Dinh Vietnam race here in lovely uh, Quy Nhon. And we are underway. And the first person by is gonna be Rusty Wyatt. He will run hard. He's got clear water. Jonathan, there ain't nobody around for about half this lap, as they would say in America. And I'll tell you what, he's got clear sailing right now, as does Peter Moran. And then Eric Stark behind, as you see the green flag out right now. Yeah, Wyatt now, he's the first guy to post a lap. He's on the far end of the circuit, comes through that right hander, lets the boat settle just a little bit too much. Probably lost the thousandth or two on my corner. Let's see how he goes into four. That looks pretty good. Now into five. He's keeping a tight line, but he's really running that boat loose on the top of the water, getting the maximum speed and acceleration he can as he comes through number 60, down past that start finish line. Here we go. All right, our first time of the action here in Q3. Wow, 44, 168. Now the drama begins. Now we're starting to see the speed. That's three tenths of a second quicker than what we saw with Eric Stark. Peter Three Moran. tenths on the run, Steve. That's a good time. Yeah, that tells you something. Now, let's see what Eric Stark can do. He comes whistling by. Eric Stark. He's not on the flyer yet. Jonas Anderson's on a flyer, and he goes to number one with a 43.95. Wow. Tell you what, he was playing those cards close to the vest. He's right there now, and he's pushing hard. 
Who else can do a sub 44 second lap? We're about ready to find out. Is Jonas the only one who can do it? We'll have to wait and see here in the next eight and a half minutes. My goodness, that guy is bang on the money, isn't he? Huh? When it really, when, when it really matters, let's say, he just puts down the gauntlet and he means business, yeah. doesn't he? He does right now. As you take a look at Rusty White, he's trying to catch him. He's in second place. And Peter Brand just went whistling by. Jonas Anderson's got the fast time. He's got it by uh, just a tenth of a second. But at the same time, Eric Stark now has moved up into second. So guess what, Jonathan? One, two, three is what we saw in Q3, the last race. One, two, three. As the uh, driver, uh, the rookie driver, Stefan Rand from uh, Estonia in that fifth spot. Bartek Marzouak in the bottom of the heap at the moment down at six. He did not improve. He sits there. Now Rusty Wyatt comes by in anger. Uh, a little quicker. He got a little closer, Jonathan. Water conditions not as good for Wyatt as they were on that first lap that he ran, you know, Steve. Although he did improve on his time, he's obviously getting more settled into the boat, feeling a bit more comfortable as we see Jonas going for a fast one, but he's still on that 43.95. One tenth. Uh, one tenth of a second difference quick. between he and him, Eric Stark. Him and Stark, yeah, Rusty two Wyatt tenths. and third. Yeah, yeah two, two tenths, tenths yeah. of Rusty Sorry. Wyatt. So the top three are only two tenths of a second from one, two, three. That's yeah. amazing. See Stark going through again. He's not pushing. I don't think he's been pushing too hard. The last lap, I think it was a bit of a, a sighting lap. Just checking the conditions out there so that he knows he can run that board at its maximum and maybe get that pole position from Jonas Anderson. Charge a team driver, Rusty Wyatt, clicks off another lap of 44-1. Last time, though, he's setting himself up. He did a 53-8, so obviously he's trying to find clear water right now before he gives it to gas. Jonas coming through for another lap, Steve, 43-9. He obviously no, wasn't trying too hard. No, there. he had a 50 on that one, John. Yeah, I think he was just cruising Eric by. Stark, he was pushing. Stark goes to number one. Wow, a 43, 6, 5, 7. You can see that coming, Jonathan. And now he has three tenths of a second. Guess what? This is exactly what we saw, Jonathan, in Indonesia when Stark flip flopped with Jonas Anderson, and then Jonas came back and flip flopped with him before it was all over as Rusty Wyatt comes by and still sits in third. Steve, Jonas just gone through four, just gone through five, straightening up for that long start finish line. Is he going to improve the time? He looks pretty fast. Has he done enough? Let's see. Jonas Anderson did not. He did. He did a 44 3. Wow, interesting here, Jonathan. We've got plenty of time left. We're now coming up on the halfway point. It's almost uh, five minutes, just over five minutes and 20 seconds left to go here. And already the drama's big as the uh, Stefan Arana, the driver out of Estonia, came whistling by. There you look at Anderson fighting to control that boat as he comes through with Team Vietnam. And that is the rookie, Stefan Arana, really holding on to Deer Hype as. Rusty Wyatt comes by. Did he improve? He did not. Jonas on the far end of the circuit. Is he going to come in? He's got four minutes, 53 left. Is he going to come in, Steve, and change for another propeller? Maybe do a little bit more fine-tuning on the engine? He's got four minutes, but he's going to... Whatever he does, he's going to have to do it pretty quickly because if he goes in, he's then going to do a warm-up lap before he can do it faster. So is Eric, at the moment, going to take that pole position away from him? Eric Same sort Stark. of battle that we had, Steve, in Indonesia. Yeah, exactly, that's ago. what I said. One, two, three, nothing's changing. But the drama flip-flop at the very end when Jonas, at the last second, beat out Eric Stark. So plenty of time left here with over four minutes to go as you look at the Canadian driver, the rookie. And Eric Stark uh, continues to hold off Jonas Anderson. Jonas in the pit, Steve. I've just seen him pull up alongside there. Is he going to, does he have a technical problem? Is he going to be able to get out again? Let's have a look. As we see his teammate coming through, no, Jonas, back on the water. He's going for another lap. Yeah, that was, uh, I believe, his teammate who uh, went into the pits, Jonathan. Uh, Stefan went in to make a change. So Jonas Anderson comes by and Stefan out on the race circuit. So Team Vietnam, one, two, out there on the race course together. As uh, Jonas Anderson, I think we've seen this uh, drama, we've seen this movie before, haven't we? 
reoccurring. Who's going to get one? Eric Stark, Jonas Anderson. Jonas Anderson, Eric Stark. Jonas again coming through four and five. I know he didn't seem to look like he had the speed, but you know, it's, it's very deceiving. My God, he's coming down the back straight here now. He's probably running 140 miles an hour through the line. He did not, Jonathan. Uh -uh. 44 2. Interesting interesting here with just a shade over a few ticks of hitting a three minute mark here this Q3 battle for pole for Sunday's Grand Prix been in Vietnam our first time here on the lovely Central Coast we're in a, the lovely town of Cunion and having a great time in this stifling heat perfect day to be at the beach Jonathan absolutely what are we doing here Steve why aren't we on that on those glorious beaches outside our hotel but anyway Jonas again taking a nice wide line he knows two minutes to go he has to do it in the next two minutes he may be able to do two laps but with a time ticking this could be the lap that may be able to get him that pole position clear water ahead of him very, very calm, Steve. Into turn number one. Is he going to be able to take that pole back from start? Got a lighter fuel load, Jonathan. We're taking poundage out of here in kilograms as uh, his teammate, Stefan around it moves up into third. So Rusty Wyatt now, he's got to get out of that fourth spot because otherwise he's got two Vietnam boats in front of him, and that's not what he wants if he wants to try to win a second race as we watch Bartek Marswak come whistling by. He's down in sixth, and he did not improve, and neither did Peter Moranis in fifth. Yeah, Jonas going to have a second chance if he wants to go for it, but he's coming through again. He's got about another six seconds before he comes through to the start-finish line. Has he improved this time? Does not. He still he did a 44.5, which is a second and a half, or make that uh, six tenths of a second slower than what his fast time is. So uh, currently he's three tenths of a second behind Eric Stark. The other thing is, Steve. I think that if you look at the far end of the circuit as Jonas goes through that right under, my goodness. If you look on the far end of the circuit, you can see that the wind has definitely picked up. The water's got that roughness, that little bit of a popple, as we call it which, you know, makes it a little bit more difficult to post a good time. Jonas coming round again, 58 seconds, so he aborted that lap, Steve, and this is the one, the one and only lap. He may be able to get that pole position, but Stark is out there as well and putting up a fast time. All right, here we go. Less than a minute to go. 45 seconds left on the clock. We hold our breath. This is Q3. We're glad you're with us today. We're setting up to see who will be on the pole as they battle here as Eric Stark comes by cruising through he knows that it's all over he can only hope and pray that Jonas doesn't uh, jump him here and Jonas is on the fly he's way pushing hard as uh, Stefan Arne his teammate comes by knowing uh, it's over for him so the drama begins right here Peter Murat he comes by he's in fifth did he improve he's run out of time no he hasn't Let's find out here. Here comes Jonas Anderson. We hold our breath. Does he go to number one? Does Jonas Anderson do the job? And he does not. Wow. Bartak Marzowak across. And then Rusty Wyatt finishes off in that fourth place position. So they flip-flop this time. This time it's Eric Stark, victory team. He is number one at the moment as uh, Jonas Anderson tried everything that he could to try to pull the rabbit out of his hat. But uh, Jonas Anderson, who's still out there on a flyer, pushing as he comes around, and Peter Morat will come across the line for the final time. Peter Morat, and he is uh, in that fifth place position. Jonas Anderson now comes by. And uh, Jonas uh, finished things off at a 43.9. Not enough, though. So less than three-tenths of a second. Eric Stark, victory team, in business as he comes by. And Eric Stark is the man of the day here. What a great qualifying effort. He will start number one in uh, sprint race number one tomorrow. Don't forget, we've got a pair of 15 lap or 15 minute uh, sprint races on hand tomorrow. They will be in the mix for world championship points. And uh, it's a very important day. And Eric Stark will lead uh, the first heat of the sprint race and he'll be 
Rusty Wyatt will be right next to him in that second spot. And Peter Moran will be in that third spot. So that'll be the top three in heat number one tomorrow. Let's take a look at the results. Pretty dramatic, and it came down to less than three-tenths of a second. There you have it. Eric Stark flip-flops with his good buddy Jonas Anderson. Here in Vietnam, he will start number one on Sunday. Jonas Anderson starts in the second spot. Stefan Aran, the driver who is a rookie, battling with Rusty Wyatt as Rookie of the Year, continues to heat up. These are the two great rookies who are fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe for that coveted prize. And then Peter Moran. Give it a solid effort, seven tenths of a second. And then Bartak was 1.2 seconds back, which is almost a lifetime compared to what these other guys were doing. But the top three, no, the top four, Jonathan, uh, within a half a second. Yeah, I mean, that was a ding dong battle. The guy that really impressed me right at the end, mine, was Stefan Aran, the young driver, the 21 year old there. I mean, he was a, he was a tenth off Jonas. I mean, he's only sat in the Formula One boat, you know, for two Grand Prix, and uh, that's one heck of a job that he's done out there. Wyatt in fourth, uh, but that, well, that did, was a ding dong battle. We just didn't know. And Jonas tried every which way to try and improve on that lap time. And you know, he was a little bit erratic on the far end there once or twice. It probably lost him a tenth or two, which may have cost him that pole position. But all credit to uh, to the victory team and Eric Stark for a fantastic performance out here today. So Eric Stark in his 44th career start on Sunday will be looking for his fifth career victory. He's had 13 podiums for the 36 year old out of Stockholm, Sweden, and he's been on the podium eight of his last 18 starts and a tremendous day for him. Thanks for being with us, by the way, for today's qualifying and the battle for pole position. Don't forget to come back tomorrow for the all-important pair of sprint races scheduled at 11 a.m. local time or 4 o'clock uh, GMT and 12 midnight on the East Coast of North America. So for my partner, Jonathan Jones, and all the wonderfully talented broadcast crew, I'm Stephen Michael saying thanks for being with us here on a lovely day along Vietnam's central coast. And now go out and make it a great day. So long, everybody.